One of the biggest struggles for us photographers, videographers, content creators, and generally us who use data in our work environment and in our hobbies is storage. I personally, as a photographer and a content creator on YouTube, can easily get away with gigabytes upon gigabytes upon gigabytes of data from a single outing. And that is not even mentioning work like time lapses, as I did in last week's video on Noctilus and clouds. Now, the entire amount of data for that video was somewhere around 500 gigabytes. That takes up a lot of hard disk space. So back when I bought my stationary desktop, I decided to have two terabytes hard disks in it for storage and that I could work off of. However, here three years later, they are in the red zone of death. They are completely full. So now I need to find a new solution. In this video, I'll give you a basic beginner's entry to using a NAS, which is short for Network Attached Storage. What it is, the specifications, what hard disks to use, what connection speeds to work with, how to boost your transfer speeds with jumbo frames and cache acceleration, setting up a switch, securing your files on the NAS, and a few more things that are important. Now, I cannot go completely in depth with everything that I cover in this video because it's quite a lot, but I have provided a list of links that I have used to set up my NAS in the description of this video. So think of this video as an anchor video that brushes over everything that you need to know and that I find to be important about setting up an S. Now it's also important to mention that the setup I have here may be completely overkill for the vast majority of you guys out there. So rest assured that there are smaller setups, also bigger setups, if that is what you need. Now, if you have followed my channel for a while, you know that I do not do sponsored videos, at least not unless the set product is of great value to me as a photographer and hopefully also great value for you as a photographer. So when I got the chance to make a sponsored video with QNAP, who are creating NAS systems and other hardware products and Western Digital, which you ought to know as a hard disk manufacturer, I jumped on the opportunity. There was just one problem. I'm a complete simpleton when it comes to hardware and network systems, so it all seemed rather overwhelming. Luckily, it turned out not to be as hard as I first thought. And NAS is basically just a huge external hard drive that you can attach to your home network system. However, it's with a giant plus in the end because it can do so much more than just that. But the NAS is just the box. You will have to install hard disks into it. And that is where Western Digital comes into the picture because they have sent over these bad boys right here. So yeah, they're not particularly sexy. It is a hard drive, but these Western Digital Red Plus 14 terabyte hard disks are essential for the NAS to get the job done. And with these hard disks, it definitely does get the job done. They have just hit the market and they are the top of the top. Unlike desktop drives, these drives are specifically tested for compatibility with NAS systems for optimum performance. Since a NAS is designed to always be on, so are the Western Digital Red Plus, so they don't break or melt down. So they are highly reliable. And on top of that, the drives are specifically designed with RAID error recovery control to help reduce failures within the NAS system. And their noise and vibration protection is designed to thrive in multi-bay NAS system environments. So to sum up, as a NAS is designed to always be on, reliable drives are essential. They are tested for 24-7 usage with efficient caching for big files, which makes the drives ideal for photo, 4K and 8K video editing and other demanding applications. And I am currently editing this video on my desktop with all the video files stored on the NAS. 
The NAS that QNAP sponsored has the sexy name TVSH1288X, and yeah, when it comes to naming products, they're not really better than camera manufacturers. It is a 12 bay NAS, which means it has slots for 12 discs, 8 big slots which can contain both regular hard disks and SSDs, and 4 slots for 2.5 inch SSDs. You can see the precise compatibility on the product page. On top of that, the NAS even have two slots for NVMe SSD drives via the M.2 connectors. Here Western Digital was again very generous to sponsor two 1TB Western Digital SA500 drives and two 1TB Western Digital Black SN750 drives. All these SSDs are high performance and also built for a NAS environment. The hard disks are very easy to plug in. You just take out the base, unlock them and put in the hard drive. Make sure to turn it the right way, lock the bay and just slide it back in and it is equally easy with the two Western Digital SA500 SSDs. For the NVMEs you need a little more finesse, but it actually turned out to be very easy. You need to open up the NAS, any screwdriver set from IKEA is probably enough, and locate where to install the drives. In the case of this NAS, I needed to dismount the fan, which was also easily done, and then just plug in the drives. It is advisable to be a little bit more careful than I was, also be careful not to touch the pins or the components on the drive because of risk of static discharge damaging them. To begin with, I installed both NVMEs, but later figured out one was enough and installed the other one in my desktop PC for increased performance of my photo and video editing software. If you are to only take one thing away from this video, get an NVMe and use that as the hard disk where you have installed all your video and photo editing software. The speed increase is ridiculous. The TVS H1288X comes with several USB ports, HDMI out and both four 2.5 and two 10 gigabit ethernet connections. This NAS does not come with built-in Thunderbolt connection, which is an even faster connection than 10 gigabit. You will need an extra hardware card, which QNAP made sure to also provide. It was very easy to install, as there were only one slot available for it. The Thunderbolt connection further future-proofs the system. The only problem is the Thunderbolt connection only supports Mac OS. If you are on a Windows based PC or laptop, the Ethernet connections are your best option. Luckily, that isn't a big problem for me. By also providing me with their 10 gigabit Ethernet dual port QXG10G2T107, mm -hmm, those names, <laughs> QNAP enabled me to build a 10 gigabit Ethernet system. Considered I have never worked with hardware like this, it was again surprisingly easy to install the 10 gigabit Ethernet network card, as my motherboard already had a couple of free slots for it. Make sure to check if your desktop motherboard supports this card. To make it work, I just needed to install the driver, which is available on QNAP's homepage. Even though the system is connected via 10 gigabit Ethernet, it's important to notice that your system will never be faster than the weakest link. This is where hard drive read and write speed plays a decisive role. If I want to move data from one of my old hard disks in my desktop onto the NAS, the speed will never be faster than that of the slowest hard disk. This is why I installed the second 1TB Western Digital NVMe as my D drive in my desktop and installed my editing software on that. This means I can reach close to a 10 GB Ethernet connection working off of my NAS instead of the 1.5 gigabit connection off of my original hard disks. A massive speed boost. Finally, QNAP also sent me a switch, which is a small station in your system where you can connect all sorts of different devices via Ethernet. The switch they sent me has the sexy name of QSWM21082C. I guess as long as they themselves know what that means, it's okay. I really feared getting this set up as I would have to go in and allocate different IPs and MAC addresses or whatever was necessary to have such a device running. Luckily, or rather magically, it's really just plug and go, no installation required whatsoever. Just plug in the cables and devices you want connected, and they connect. How amazing is that? You can of course also set it up manually exactly as you want with the interface, but for newbies like me that was surprisingly simple. I could even just connect my router to the switch, and then all of the devices connected to the switch had internet. 
The switch does make a weak noise because of the fan, but it is not something that I take notice of. One thing to be aware of is that your IP addresses may change if you do not use static IPs when you plug or unplug your router, so be aware of that. I have set some ports for static IPs and others for automatic, creating new IPs. So there are of course also videos about that on YouTube. The NAS did come with one Ethernet cable, but you may need several in case you are setting up an entire system like this. I need three as to connect the desktop to the switch, the router to the switch and the NAS to the switch. I just went with the newest CAT8 cables which support up to 40 gigabit Ethernet. Depending on whether you use Thunderbolt, you obviously also need one such cable. To connect to the NAS and the switch, the easiest way is to install the software QFinder Pro from QNAP. Just hit refresh and the QNAP devices ought to show up. To begin with, QFinder Pro couldn't locate the switch, but it was easily solved by resetting the switch and I haven't had any issues since. If you do have issues, you can always attach the NAS directly to a desktop and set it up without having the switch as an intermediate device. So when you're setting up the NAS, you simply just go into QFinder Pro and log into your NAS and start the setup process. I won't go into deep details with this as QNAP UK has a couple of great videos on that that I'll link to in the description. Once you go to the storage and snapshot tab, you can get a great overview of what hard disks you have installed in the NAS. Again, I won't go into deep details with setting up the hard disks, but here is a brief overview. I went with two storage pools. A storage pool is one or a collection of hard drives in your NAS that you use to store your data. I made one storage pool out of the two 1TB Western Digital RED SA500 for all system files in a RAID 1 constellation. RAID 1 means I use one of the hard disks as a mirror in the unlikely case the other one breaks. You can further configure this in various ways, but I just went with the default settings. For the 8 hard drives, I went with a RAID 6 setup, which was recommended by most NAS related videos on YouTube. RAID 6 occupies the size of two hard disks, but also makes sure I can have two hard disks fail at once, yet still save all my data. The risk of this happening is absolutely minimal with these high quality hard disks, but it is a fail safe you would want to consider. Whether you can even choose RAID 6 depends on how many hard disks you have installed. Alternatively, you can go with RAID 5 where you occupy one hard disk, but only one hard drive can then fail. You need to make up your mind about this upon creating the storage pool as you can only increase the RAID setup, not decrease it. You can upgrade from RAID 0 to RAID 1, RAID 1 to RAID 5, and so on, but you cannot go from a RAID 6 to a RAID 5 without having to recreate the storage pool, which deletes all the data on the implemented drives. Once your storage pool is in place, you need to create a volume. Until you create a volume, you can't transfer data to the hard drive. A volume is like a folder on your desktop and the one which you will see in your browser. I created one single volume to store all my data, that being all my photos, video files and so forth. You can manage so many other things via the control panel, which I'll let you explore yourself via the QNAP UK presentations. There are, however, a few important things I want to touch on. And one such thing is jumper frames. Setting up the NAS, I didn't really get the speeds I expected. Luckily QNAP helped out and suggested to enable jumper frames. Generally most new NAS drives and switches support jumper frames and avoiding all the technical stuff, jumper frames basically means you can move large data faster. You need to enable jumper frames in both your NAS, your switch, which may be on by default, and the network card you use in your setup. For me, that's the provided 10 gigabit ethernet network card. You also want to make sure the settings for the jumper frames are aligned across all devices. The higher the better, and in my case it is 9000 bytes. This gave me a speed boost of about 80% and speeds up to about 900 megabyte per second for video files and about 600 megabyte per second for smaller photo files, which is very acceptable for a RAID 6 setup. As mentioned, I installed one of the NVMEs in the NAS. The main purpose of such an NVMe is to use it as cache acceleration, which gives the system another boost to the transfer speeds. Once the NVMe is installed, you just activate it through the control panel. You choose the SSD you want to use, and since I move many big files, I select the option for that. If you're not using an unused disk for this, be aware everything on the disk will be deleted once you install it for cache acceleration. 
Another way to protect your NAS is by taking what's called snapshots. This basically creates a photo of how your hard disk looked at a certain time that you then can restore if you by accident manage to delete some super important data or gets attacked by malware. I use the settings with smart snapshot recommended by QNAP UK from their presentation. It is also important to keep your NAS safe from external sources. It is a computer and that comes with all the security measures you need to take with any other device. The QNAP NAS does come with antivirus software where you can set it up for different kinds of scan jobs and specify what it should scan and how often. Malware protection is just as important and the NAS comes with that too. Just like antivirus, it is simple to set up for various jobs. Firewall protection comes with Q Firewall, which you can also get via the App Center. I went for basic protection, but you can of course be much more specific about wishes for firewall protection. It is also important to keep these apps up to date. If you have the NAS connected to the internet, you can easily scan and set the apps for automatic updates on a daily basis via the App Center. Likewise, you can set the firmware to auto-updating or be selective about what firmware you want to run on the NAS. As we know from the rest of the software world, the newest firmware is not always the best. That being said, as a rule of thumb, it is usually the best for the average user to make sure they run the latest firmware. You can also have the option for remote connection. The easy one is via QNAP's own services, which there are several videos about on the internet. It goes without saying, your NAS needs to be on and online for this to work. If your NAS doesn't appear automatically in your Windows browser under the Networks tab, which it didn't for me, as my standard setting is not to have the router attached to the NAS, you may have to manually create the connection to the NAS, which is very simple once you know how to do it. As with anything in life, just right click on your network and click the Add Network Drive, Select drive and add the IP with a couple of backslashes first. If you don't know the IP of the NAS, you can see it in QFinder Pro. Once you've added the IP, just press browse and select the folder you want to connect to. In my case, it was the volume in the NAS I used to store all my files. It should now be visible in your Windows browser. As mentioned, a NAS is basically a computer, so it comes with so many more options and apps. You can set it up as a server, a gaming server, set up home pages, you can use it as a media station, you can install different apps such as QMaggy, which is a photo sorting app, or set the NAS up as a wireless access point. I've also added a link to QNAP UK where they cover all these features. So there are a few things to be aware of. QNAP provided me with the TVS H1288X, which is one of the more expensive NAS models. You do, however, get a lot of bang for the buck. QNAP obviously have so many different NAS models available, which may cover your needs better. This specific model is a big one, and without having anything to compare with, it does make a constant sound from both the fan and the hard disks working. It's supposedly not too bad, the size of the machine considered, but you probably do want to place it in a location where you don't hear it. I have also found that placing some bubble wrap underneath the NAS greatly reduces the vibration noise. For the hard disks, Western Digital also provides many different sizes of the RED Plus series at various prices so you ought to be able to find what works the best for you. One strategy is to get a big NAS and a few hard disks to begin with, and then later add more hard disks as your need for extra space increases. I've learned it is not advised to mix different types of brands of hard disks. I have no clue why, but just have that in mind too. If you have any technical questions about the NAS or the setup or so forth, I am not the person to ask. QNAP are much better or you can even ask QNAP UK. Western Digital, of course, can also answer all the questions you have about the hard disks. So now that you have seen how relatively easy it is to set up an S, it takes a little bit of time. Are you interested in getting an S? Let me know down in the comments. And if you learned something from this video, I would highly appreciate a like. Thanks so much for watching.